say uh, forgive me uh, because i have changed the intro what i was to say for the introduction in the last moment also because because of the kind of uh, suggestions that i got from my friend so if there is some grammatical mistake or something just just ignore that yeah and uh, 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 you know just get the crux of what i am you know <laughs> what are the feelings behind writing what i have written okay uh, good evening everyone my name is supriya ranjan and i welcome you all on behalf of jnu academy for those of you who are new to our platform jnu academy is an entirely student driven platform that enrich and enliven possibilities of democratic discourse inside the campus on issues that are of social relevance the task of introducing someone like professor sudipto kaviraj is fraught with challenges the idea to introduce a scholar before the seminar is generally undertaken to introduce the speaker to an audience who do not know about the speaker i think it would be redundant to do that to an audience someone you know to an audience like ours and with someone like professor kaviraj yet and this is something that gurpreet mahajan once insisted during a seminar that introduction form an indispensable part of an intellectual gathering and it can can't be just done away with she claimed that it has other purposes and other purposes of to inspire young researchers and students who <coughs> students of what they can aspire up to and look up to let me then take an alternative route in introducing professor kaviraj with the hope that it is able to inspire us and two it serves the other purpose of lightening up the overall all heavy mood seeing the title of the talk that 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 we are that that is going to follow the discussion that is going to follow so taking inspiration from taking inspiration and yet not replicating what the, the famous distinction christian by dipesh chakravarti between cloistered or academic versus the public life of history uh <clears throat> public uh, let me attempt to give a few anecdotes in order to give you a public sketch of professor kaviraj in the lives of cps students who form the bread and butter of this discussion in particular and jnu in general so and these are these are the first memories uh, that uh, cps students would get when when they they enter into cps <laughs> these are the things that they would learn about professor kaviraj the presence of Kavir, uh, professor kaviraj is such an in, unmistakable part of studying political studies in jnu that there is a generationally passed lingo among students at the center that the s in cps stands for sudipto indeed his insights on indian politics and intellectual history changed not only the way how conceptual issues were to be approached but a wholesale change of interest areas itself for many of us who had who had who had been taught indian politics to be uh, to 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 be an study of constitutions institutions and disparate events during our undergraduate days his theoretically rich interpretations on india opened up new horizons and for most of us this was nothing less than pressing the gestalt switch his overwhelming presence in our courses and conversations meant <clears throat> and opened new ways of interpretation and a wholesale change in the problematics and frames itself another enriching story story of his has been that has been generally generationally passed on uh, to among us has been professor kaviraj's passion, passionate uh, you know abilities of passionate teaching we have only heard stories about it the fact that he has been a teacher a guide a mentor to a generation of scholars who then went on to have an indispensable stamp on the way and what we study in social sciences in india is just a testament of his great nurturing abilities i would like to end this with a particular incident that keeps recurring whenever i and my colleagues talk about professor kaviraj actually professor kaviraj visited Uh, our center some four or five years ago for a lecture that he had come to deliver at the uh, weekly wednesday seminar 
uh, in 2016 i guess and there was a huge commotion among students uh, before you know he was to deliver the lecture that okay professor kaviraj is coming and we are just new into the center and there were two uh, you know remarkable thing things that whoever attended that uh, lecture would remember clearly one was you know professor guru's passionate introduction that he gave of professor kaviraj he began saying that and he was so passionate uh, while introducing his teacher professor kaviraj that he went on to say that uh, professor kaviraj is not a person and then he paused and that pause was you know a sort of and we were just keep on keeping thinking what he is going to say the next line and he said professor kaviraj is not a person he is an idea <laughs> and that became a bone of you know <laughs> a numerous conversation as to you know what, what can be the best introduction that anybody can give and professor guru was able to deliver that another was you know that there was a question during the lecture and and most of us i know most of us who were new uh, to in our mas- during our masters thought that this was a nonsensical question that was being put to him and it was a question asked by a student and within five, you know 2 to 3 minutes when he came to respond to that question that question became the most in you know the most enriching you know the response to that question became the most enriching response of the whole of the conversation and in that you know you know in 5 minutes we learned how you know you know learned a lot about the, the you know the humility and the modesty with which an academician should approach you know whatever is being put to him and that is something you know uh, you know th- those are two memories that anybody who attended the last lecture of him at cps would remember so uh, with that i uh, you know i, I welcome sir kaviraj to deliver this lecture uh, also i i'd like just like to mention the overall format of this discussion uh, actually we had requested professor kaviraj to deliver a lecture and he um rightfully and i think uh, it was uh, it was better for both him and us that he said that he would send us a set of readings and then we can have a focused discussion kind of thing so 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 keeping in line with that we we have we decided to have a small group who were ready to uh, read those set of readings and were uh, ready to engage with him and 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 hence this uh, you know in the closed format of this talk and uh, 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 so so what i will um, what we will do is that professor kaviraj will initially uh, say speak for uh, uh, 10 to 15 uh, minutes about uh, you know the rationale behind sending those set of readings and you know the overall you know if he wants to make any remarks initially uh, uh, so so with, with that i hand over to professor kaviraj and then we can you know go ahead with taking questions that we had prepared uh, you know or or the issues that uh, each one of us found in the reading or uh, and we can then take upon questions from facebook as well hopefully yeah with that you can begin okay <coughs> can you hear me now yeah we can hear you yes okay. yeah okay uh so what i shall do is um i shall you know from my my angle it would be better if we have more of uh, questions and discussions rather than my giving a lecture but i shall repeat what i did uh, just about a couple of weeks back for a discussion that was organized in colombia on uh, some of my papers but again focusing on very similar papers all the papers were on marxism uh, i got a mail yesterday from somebody saying that i should explain why i did not include in the papers that i asked people to read uh, papers that i wrote long back but some of the papers that i sent were also written long ago uh, like the critique of the passive revolution the reason is that you know i work in 3 4 to my mind interconnected but very different areas and uh, i think we can have a good discussion and it would be enriching from my point of view 
if we can keep focus on one set of questions rather than get dispersed over you know, questions of the Indian state, Marxism, uh, philosophical aesthetics, uh, Bengali literature, and things like that. But what I shall be happy to do would be, uh, this is what I propose to do. If you give me about 15 minutes, I can introduce um, uh, very briefly how I have thought about Marx and Marxism because everybody's reading of Marx is different and uh, you have to respond you know to the personal idiosyncrasies of individual thinking so I can present that and then after that we can go into a question answer session you can ask me questions and I can respond is that okay yeah yes sir, uh, yes, sir. okay sure. so I'll um, you know, I was born in a communist family, uh, which actually turned upside down, you know, some of the ordinary relationships through which Indians come to Marxism. Uh, individuals are born into families and overcome, have to overcome what, uh, you know, older Indian uh, philosophers would call their samskaras, that is, thought through which we think, but which are so deep in our mind, it's very difficult to, um, you know, bring them out from the depth of your own thinking and put them in front of you to set up um, a critical relationship with them. <clears throat> so oddly for me, Marxism constituted my sanskara in a certain sense, uh, because my father was a Marxist historian. But uh, gradually, what happens to other people also happened to me that uh, you know, when you start thinking, your relationship with what you had received from what was in the background of your thinking, your relationship with that becomes loser. Now, so I, uh, the Marxism that was handed down to me, which I had to outgrow in a sense, was the tradition of or the heritage of Bengali leftism, Bengali Marxism. But I found two things about that. I found something profoundly attractive and also something which I found quite troubling in that heritage. The attractive side, which uh, I would emphasize because this is a meeting of <coughs> young people, because I think, you know, it's not the meek who inherit the earth, I think it's the young who inherit the earth. Um, anyway, so uh, what I found very attractive was that it uh, urge people to think about how degradation in society could be ended. I grew up in a society, you know, where the most obvious and the enveloping and inextricable thing was poverty and the degradation related to poverty. It was like, you know, in the Calcutta in which I grew up, it was like a kind of totally all pervasive stench that you could not uh, get out of. And so obviously anybody who starts growing up there would have to give some attention to that. Um, so we grew up with so much of degradation around us that that was a natural, almost instinctive response for any young person. I think young persons naturally uh, seek to live in a world, uh, in a beautiful world. They think that they deserve to live in a world which is unstained by suffering. And that draws people to emancipatory theories of this kind. But there was also a problem with that because uh, I was taught to see only one kind of degradation around me, which was poverty and class. And in a certain sense, ordered by that thinking not to see anything else. And this became later on a kind of intellectual crisis for me, because when I moved out of Kolkata and into North India, I started thinking a bit about, not about West Bengal, but about India. I found that the other pervasive, probably even more pervasive form of degradation in my society was caste, which uh, Bengali Marxism basically stopped me from thinking about, you know, by not by arguing against it, but by obliviating it. Thank you.
no <coughs> i also found unattractive a certain kind of heavy and wooden clunky structure of that uh, explanatory mechanism um uh, you know giving up abjuring everything which was subtle refined elusive uh which needed uh, an engagement with complexity and it was attracted only to a kind of certitude that uh, heavy reductionism provides so that i found problematic uh, very early so there were too many iron laws in that marxism uh, which obstructed thinking and it was also something like a theory of everything which i think you have to you have to set aside this kind of thinking in order to start thinking about marxism on your own so i when i started thinking about it i found that there were two things which um uh, i had to change in that or think about um i shall put it very briefly because i hope we shall come back to it during the discussion the first problem was with politics partly because i was a student of political science i taught political science and uh, i found that the explanatory apparatus for politics inside the marxism that i received uh, was uh, was very inadequate uh, all it did you know was essentially to give an abstract advice that uh, to look for a revolution i have said in a bengali paper that i wrote very recently but i am willing to get into that in great detail that uh, i later on found that the problem was that if lenin's book for instance which is called state and revolution had been called revolution and state the opposite sequence it might have been better because of course lenin thinking i think is very rich in the demonstration of the possibility of revolution in a very backward country like russia which was very innovative but i felt that you know about the question of power after the revolution had gone through there was very very little in the marxist tradition uh, what i got in marx was very small but clear when i got to lenin and withering away of the state i thought that you know it was a kind of rainbow colored dream kind of thing it didn't tell me anything about the nature of the power of the party apparatus what the uh, officials of the party were allowed to do were not allowed to do etc it was extremely vague i also felt that the denunciation of democracy as bourgeois democracy was misleading i thought you know the democracy in which we live uh doesn't have everything coming from the bourgeoisie so in a sense calling modern democracy bourgeois uh bourgeois democracy i think seemed to me to be wrong i also wrote a paper in bengali about that if you want we can come back to it so i thought that there were two problems about um, the question of politics uh, we did not have a sufficiently sophisticated complex explanatory apparatus for the study of politics uh although i was very attracted to gramsci uh, to althusser and others who provided me with very important insight i've written about that in bangla in the last uh, year or so quite extensively so that was on the one side i thought that the explanatory uh, apparatus of political life needed to be expanded and made more sophisticated and secondly I was convinced of something which I think Etienne Balibar has put very powerfully that we got uh, played into uh, believing that uh, the two great ideals of the emancipated tradition running down from the french revolution equality and liberty they had to be sort of played against each other that if you ask for liberty you have to uh, give up on uh, equality and if you ask for equality you have to give up on liberty i think this was one of the very big mistakes that uh, was there in the earlier tradition of marxism 
And we can see that, you know, if you do not see this living in today's world, you know, me living in Trump's America and you're living in uh, BJP's India, uh, you know, I think it's actually one of the most important, obvious questions. Um, then uh, the second question was that uh, was about the European origin and conceptual limits of received Marxism. So uh, Marxism was part of European social theory, which is part of the self-reflection of European modernity. So obviously the theory was actually meant to make sense of how modernity unfolded in Europe. And I very quickly realized that, you know, to understand modernity in India, that theory has to be bent, modified, changed, refitted. You have to do a lot of modification to that theory before it even began to grasp uh, the question of colonialism, the colonial, uh, you know, the colonial introduction to modernity in India and things like that. So, and it also raised that question, how can you make a theory intended to analyze one society, produce an equally felicitous analysis of another, very different one, without any kind of modification. So I tried to supply, you know, what I considered to be inadequacy, essentially by drawing upon three different sources within the Marxist tradition. I'm not saying that everybody should do it, but this is how I tried to do it. One was to go back uh, much more deeply into, in some way, lost Hegelian tradition within Marxist thought. I'm saying lost, not in the sense that it's really lost historically, but it was lost to the Comintern tradition of Marxism. The Comintern tradition of Marxism simply is not interested in the Hegelian uh, background of many of Marx's arguments, many of Marx's concepts, etc. And I was very attracted to Lukács uh, for many reasons, but also because, you know, Lukács is, I think, one of the major Marxist figures who restates with great force uh, something which is very central to German thought, uh, the development of historicism, Historicism not, however, in Karl Popper's sense. That's the sense in which, for instance, Dipesh uses it in, um, in his work. I'm using historicism in the old German sense of the term, the sense in which it is associated with people like Tiltai, Gadamar, etc., which is based on a profound distinction between the Naturwissenschaften, natural sciences, and Geisteswissenschaften, that the sciences of the spirit or the sciences of human sciences essentially focused on the understanding of reason rather than causes. There's a very interesting uh, chapter in Habermas's theory of communicative action because the book is so large, it's easy to ignore that chapter. But here's a very, very interesting chapter on Luca where he stresses this, that Luca is one of the great Marxist thinkers, who insists on this in a kind of unforgettable manner. I must also say that I deviate from most Marxists and uh, others in believing that Marx is a great figure in the historicist tradition of German thought. Uh, people normally see the sequence as, you know, originating in Hegel and then going to Dilthey because Dilthey uses Hegel's objective mind so centrally in his writing. But I, and then to Gadamer and people like that through the influence of Heidegger. But I believe that, you know, that uh, lineage should be slightly modified. And we should see the lineage as coming from Hegel to Marx to Dilthey, like that. So I see Marx as a great historicist figure. Secondly, I was very attracted to Gramsci. And I thought that Gramsci's ideas can help us develop a much better explanatory model for political life, particularly for democracy, than the available competing liberal model. And finally, the third form of Marxism, which I 
found very attractive was Althusser and structuralism because of what it did to the idea of the totality and the idea of structure and dominance, etc., which I thought gave us a philosophically rigorous understanding of the notion of structure, which was uh, non-reductionist, which was open-ended and non-teleological in thinking about history. Now, very quickly about two things. Uh, when I turn to, you will see that at one point I became very interested in the question of modernity. And I felt that the theory of modernity has to be refitted in some ways to become usable for us. I tried to do that very minimally, making the first two or three moves in the essay called Outline of Revisionist Theory of Modernity. But it is just the beginning. Uh, it's not the full theory. But I don't think without doing that kind of theory, uh, you can get into a serious, rigorous understanding of modernity in the world outside of Europe. The other thing that happened to me was that when I asked, where do I find this kind of self-reflection of modernity in India? Because, you know, we belong to one of the great intellectual traditions of the world. So our people must be thinking about what is happening to ourselves um, in our modern history. But where is that thought? And I later on realized that that thought was actually secreted away in a place where I we were not used to looking. That is, we did not look in that direction when we looked for theoretical understanding of Indian modernity, which was in literature. So I gradually came to realize that, you know, much of the thinking about what is the self, how is the self changing, what is the nature of time, what is the nature of modernity, what is the modern state very different from the uh, earlier kind of state, is modern politics uh, a force of liberation or a force of en enslavement? absolutely central questions of European social theory, I realized that our literary tradition engaged with those and thought about it. So you will see that in one part of my work, what I do is I throw these questions which are taken from Western social theory to a body of texts, which are not theoretical texts in that sense, but which are literary texts like Tagore, Bunkim, Pudev, and uh, other in Bengali literature. Finally, I want to make a last point very quickly and finish. I was also very interested intermittently. I think that is also because of the intermittent character of his work <coughs> uh, in Walter Benjamin. Not very popular with Indian Marxists. I know that you know people in JNU have shown interest. I think Gurpreet has. Uh, supervised work on that. I think Mohinder Singh uh, probably did his, either his MPhil or PhD on Walter Benjamin. But Benjamin is not very popular with Indian Marxists, except for those who work on film, <coughs> media, etc. But I found him attractive in a very different way. But that has also shaped my intellectual interest quite profoundly. Uh, not just the astounding expansion of Marxism into the fields of art and culture in a way that knew no reductive crudeness at all. But I gradually learned to see in him, in him something else that was very unusual. I felt that you know Benjamin was so attractive, so different, because he was very, uh, he was utterly exceptional among Marxists in this, that as a Jewish intellectual, he had access to a completely different language, which was a language of a religious tradition, and a language of a religious tradition which had suffered for a very long time at the center of its, uh, you know, center of its vision, because that is what it was reflecting on continually, and I found that very very interesting. So think about the passage about the angel of history <coughs> and the language that he's constantly using. I'm now using language in the, in the literal sense. If you look at the passage itself, there's an angel of history in which as a good angel has its wings spread out and there's a storm 
blowing from paradise, not paradise, angel with wings, paradise. There's a look of anguish in his eyes because the storm is destroying everything and piling up the debris of human civilization at his feet. He cannot move forward because his wings are caught in the, the wind of the storm. And he cannot do anything except grieve, which is also quite unusual among Marxist thinkers. Um, you know, this kind of, it's not pessimism, but it is something more complex. Um, so I felt that, you know, if you follow Benjamin, and the reason why Benjamin is so interesting is that he showed the possibility that you can be attracted to Marxism. Marxism can be quite central to your thinking. But that does not mean that it has to come at the cost of all other languages that come to you through your own civilization, right? Particularly languages which are developed in religious tradition over a very long time. Obviously, our relation with our religious tradition and we are critical. There are lots of things which are, we must object to, we must try to destroy. But at the same time, there are many things in the religious tradition which can be useful. And more than the tradition, the language of suffering itself, I sometimes, when I read Ambedkar, I feel that, you know, what he does not have, it's not his fault. What he does not have is that he doesn't have the kind of pre-existing language of suffering that uh, Benjamin has. So Ambedkar is somebody who is an inheritor quite self-consciously of a very long tradition of collective suffering in his society. But he is an inheritor to only two languages, the language of liberalism, which is his main language, and the language of Marxism, which I think he uses subtly in different ways. But both these languages are very, very different types of language. So because of that, I concluded that if you have possession of more languages like this, and he was like Benjamin in the sense that despite becoming Marxist, he has not allowed those languages slip from his grasp, then we can do history in a way which is more expanded. And so more recently, over the last 10 years, I've become more interested in two fields, very, very narrow fields. You know, uh, do not misunderstand my claim. I'm not a Sanskrit. I know very little about the vast Sanskrit world. But I have a deep interest in philosophical aesthetics, the question of, you know, why is art enjoyable? And I find that, you know, in the thinking of the Kashmir Shaiva, in the Rasa theory of the 8th to 10th century, you have an amazing um, philosophical uh, tradition. And I think it is also developed in very peculiar, interesting ways by the Vaishnavas around the 15th to the 17th century. So I'm very interested in that uh, now. I just finished a paper for philosophy East and West on representation. When it comes out, I think it will come out in January, you will see the first part is about the question of representation in Western political thought in Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau particularly. And then the second part, which is a longer part, draws upon some ideas from two thinkers in the Kashmiri tradition, Sean Kuka, and Avinavadita, and tries to think through some of the questions generated by uh, Western political thinking through their resolutions of some of the problems of uh, representation. So I'm interested in that kind of thing. So I hope because of all this, I think better than I did before. But what remains of my relation with Marxism, I'm not very sure. And But one thing is certain that I do not uh, regret it. And uh, I think in thinking through history, society, and politics, uh, essentially you try to find a way of thinking which is your own, in which you bring in whatever resources you can. And in our kind of academic life, I think what is important and enjoyable is not the destination, but the path itself. And in this kind of thinking, in however small a way, it is more enjoyable because in both senses of the word, it does not have an end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, should we, uh, been, should we begin with the? Uh, yeah, question? of course. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Ishan, you, uh, you can just, uh, uh, you know, you yeah. begin. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, before uh, the question, I'll just make a brief remark on one of the themes in your papers, which uh, caught my attention, and you've touched upon it too. In Marx and post-colonial thinking, you talk about how the conceptual apparatus of Marxism uh, has to be reworked from the study of the first order information and analytical operation leading to a theoretical uh, reflection all based in the context where uh, the first order reflection is drawn upon. While uh, initially this may, uh, I mean in the manner in which a graph was given it seemed a bit relativist. Uh, in Marx's writing on India you refer to an implied methodological injunction in Marx's writing on formation to see them in terms of modes of production. So this coexistence of uh, methodological universalism and theoretical pluralism uh, is something that I found to be really interesting and uh, intellectually fruitful. Uh, so uh, my question will also follow from this, at least the first question. Uh, in the prescribed papers and uh, also your paper Marxism in in translation, caste is a regular reference for the difficulty faced by uh, the dialect. Let, 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 let us do, you know, one by one the question. Yeah, only. So okay, I'll, I... I'll do. I'll do only one. Uh, so should I? No, you can ask the second question, but let me respond to the first because I'll, otherwise I'll you... forget all the nuances of your question. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'll respond briefly. First of all, I think it's a very good question because. This question is at the center of um, not just my thinking, you know, anybody who is reasonable and, and thinks about this issue uh, would have to come up against this question. And what I would say is that there is a certain movement in my own thinking between uh, the early paper on the status of Marxist writing on India, which was written in 83. I think it, I wrote it when I was in Oxford, I think in 80, 82 or something. I remember discussing it with a lot of people there. And, but you will see that even in that paper, uh, or let me put it this way, that in the question of the universal, it needs to be thought about more because we seem to think that there are only two possibilities. You know, one is the universal and the antonym to the universal is the particular, right? This is also how a lot of European theory, which is relevant for this, let's say, Dilthai, thinks about it like that. There's a universal and there's a particular. But in Hegel and in Dilthai, and to my mind also in Marx because of that, there's a suggestion of something which is more complex. That we did not say that there are only two possibilities. You know, one is the universal, which is invariant, and the particular, which is always variant, right? I think if we look at the way we use the term universal, even in ordinary language, we'll find that we use universal in two ways. You know, think of the universality of the human body. This is the example that I give to the students that wherever you have a human being, you would have one nose and two eyes and two ears, etc. So it is a universal, which is invariant, right? So the anatomy of the human body is an invariant universe. But human language is also a universal. Wherever you have a human being, you will universally get language, right? But the universality of language is not like the universality of the human body, right? In When we think of language, we find that there is a form of the universal, which is a variant universal, right? Not an invariant universal. So we have to think in terms of, you know, at least two possibilities of using two meanings of the term universal. And if we divide the universal itself into these two parts, then the hardness of the binary between universal and particular is softened in some way. You know, you open up uh, middle ways where you can think, right? 
I'm not saying that I'm giving you a solution to this. But what I'm saying is that if you do not make a move of this kind, then you simply cannot take any steps forward. Right. So from that point of view, when I uh, look at uh, Europe, you will see that in my thinking, if you look at the uh, 2018 essay, in my thinking, there is a movement towards greater generality as you move from the empirical historical, the first order, to the second order that is analytical, which is not just a redescription of the empirical. It can be a redescription of the empirical, but in terms which are different, you know, it's analytical. And then the third is theoretical. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that, you know, for instance, think of the uh, criticism that Weber makes at one point against Marx. We should not make too much of it because, you know, Weber is also a highly sophisticated thinker and he recognizes Marx equally as a highly sophisticated thinker. So I don't think we should turn that into a slogan coming from Weber against Marx. But Weber says at one point that one of the difficulties with the level of abstraction at which the writing of capital is pitched is that, uh, you know, it obstructs in a certain way thinking about the particularities of individual histories of capitalist development. So he famously rhetorically says that when we write history, we don't write the history of capitalism. We write the history of capitalisms in the plural. How can we write the history of capitalism? He says that, you, know, you can only write the history of capitalism in Germany or capitalism, which is different from the capitalism in, in England, which is different from capitalism in Italy, right? Now, so I think that involves a certain kind of abstraction, right? So when Marx is saying, no, I'm writing something which is true, not of any single country, precisely because it is true of all, right? So it actually involves this kind of, you know, level of abstraction problem. A lot of Marxists have written about it because, you know, this is central to Marx's thought. Uh, he sometimes uses it in the language which he draws from Hegel. This is why I think, you know, very good knowledge of Hegel is absolutely essential uh, in terms of the abstract and the concrete. Hegel continually talks about the concrete, the concrete and the concrete in many different senses. So Marx sometimes expresses it in the language of the abstract and the concrete. We can use it, use the language of abstraction and generality and things like that. So my point is that, you know, we need theories which are, uh, theories which can make sense of variations within very large totalities of, you know, civilizational or societal totalities, like let's say the Indian subcontinent. You know, India is not a single unit um, before the 19th century. But that does not mean that, you know, there is no sort of singularity of a different kind in this subcontinent, right? So you, if you have to say something about this, a place. It has to be in the nature of something which is general. We have been having discussions about this in the Indian uh, thought collective. For instance, you know, the, there are important regional trajectories in India. The trajectory in Odisha is different from the trajectory in Bengal, which is different from the trajectory in, in Maharashtra, which is different from the trajectory in, uh, in Punjab. So I think everywhere, in the Islamic world, in the East Asian world of China, Japan, in the Indic world, we need abstractions which go up to that level. So that's why I would hold on, you know, to the idea of three different levels. One is the level of, the first order level of empirical knowledge. And I'm very keen to stress that, you know, that is something which is absolutely indispensable. You cannot do India you know, without actually having good historical knowledge, which must be based on vernacular language at least. But vernacular language is not always enough because, you know, the uh, thinking about these questions are in the esoteric language, you know, Sanskrit, Persian, etc. So I would, this is the way I approach that question, that, you know, in the European world, you have all the three levels. In the other worlds, we now have quite a robust, you know, quite a vast accumulation of 
historical knowledge. We also have, you know, good scholars who do a lot of analytical thinking about these things. But somehow I think there's a hesitation to go to the third level. And what happens is that when we go to the third level, we simply snatch at something which is already there, you know, from Weber or Marx or someone like that. And it doesn't work. So that's the argument. But remember one thing that, you know, I cannot say how deeply I feel this now, that, you know, the nature of theoretical work, I think, is, this is another sense in which this question of destination and path is very important. I think the task, I strongly agree with an early analytic philosophy proposition that philosophy is essentially thinking about the way we think. So it is clarificatory, right? It is not always telling you, you know, that this is the big destination to it, that we have arrived at. We try to do that, but not through philosophy, you know, through other uh, kinds of thinking, right? So that's why if you say, which you can uh, legitimately, that, you know, this is simply some methodological remark, it doesn't actually give, you, give me a clear model. My response to that would be that, you know, to my thinking, is a methodological thinking or philosophical thinking that, in that modest sense. You know, this is its main task, that we think about how we think. Not in the very big sense, you know, sometimes people would say, philosophy is thinking about thinking. This is in a very big sense. I'm actually using it in an analytically minded, very narrow sense. That, you know, it, it is something which is specialized. And the specialization is precisely that. But I think it actually yields very important clarification. It, it helps us think better. Yeah, you had a second question, sorry. I took too long answering this question. I'll be short. Uh, 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 well, I, uh, I mean, uh, this, this I, I, I wasn't able to frame this as a question per se, but thanks for answering it. Uh, uh, the qu the question uh, 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 was uh, with reference to caste. Uh, I mean, in uh, uh, the set of prescribed papers and also in another paper of yours, Marxism in translation, it's a uh, regular reference to the difficulty faced by uh, at least uh, uh, what you refer to as Bengali Marxism to translate into the Indian context. Uh, so, how do you uh, envision uh, prospectively a Marxist analysis which goes beyond looking at caste as a socio-political background and examines it as a formative context and even part of its conceptual toolbox as against uh, something which is a non-Marxist uh, analysis which employs overlapping terminology? Again, I think it's a very good question. Uh, you know, we can have a whole seminar about this, but let me answer briefly because, uh, and in a certain sense, I think this question is even more important than the earlier question, because it goes to the center of any analysis of India. I personally feel that, uh, you know, this is reflected in my uh, critical remarks about Hobbesbaum, that, uh, you know, Hobbesbaum, I don't think Hobbesbaum would disagree with what I ultimately argue, but it seems from reading Hobbesbaum's introduction to the pre-capitalist economic form that he is delighted that instead of having four or five or six categories of uh, you know, primitive communism, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, etc., we now have seven or eight. And also instead of, the second is a very important point, instead of having something which is rectilinear, and therefore being pushed into a position like it's a dangis, that he has to prove that you know India actually went through slavery to feudalism, right? Um, we have a multilinear understanding of history, right? But I have a profound difference with Hobbesbaum there. I actually see that as generative. You know, it seems to me that what Marx does is that whenever he comes across a body of empirical material, historical material, which cannot be fitted into the pre-existing theorizing, 
what you do is to hypothesize the existence of a new social form, right? So he does it rather, um, you know, rather softly without uh, emphasizing it very much. But when he discusses with Engels about Germanic forms, Slavonic forms, etc., I think that is the direction which he goes. So therefore, I think that there's absolutely no problem for a master to say that the social formation that I find in India, we should also give up Marx's uh, belief that this social formation did not change through history, you know, which is basically Hegelian belief. Hegel says quite categorically that European history changes in India. What ancient, the principle of ancient India is true of modern India as well. So which means that, you know, Indian history is just passing of time without structural change, which goes against Hegel's own, uh, you know, real theoretical insight. I do not believe that, you know, we should beat up Hegel too much about this because, you know, uh, great figures are also ignorant in some uh, aspect of their thinking. So we should simply say that, you know, it's, uh, it's an unproductive way of thinking. So we should set that aside and immediately recognize that that social form also obviously undergoes very serious change. I'll give you an example from the remarks that I made before. The more I have engaged with the Vaishnava tradition, I found that I find that what the Vaishnavas are saying through the development of this concept of bhakti, that he's ba they are basically saying that we do not agree with the earlier Hindu traditions philosophical thinking about what it means to relate to God. They're trying to de devise a completely different metaphysics about how to relate to God, right? So in intellectual history, this is enormous change. You know, it's just absolutely incalculably important change. So we should take it for granted that the society changes, you know, the social formation changes. And it's quite central that the central structure of the social formation is caste, right? There are many things which I think cannot be done. Uh, I gave a lecture in Hyderabad uh, some time back where uh, on Ambedkar, I think, and uh, I made some remarks, you know, which some people did not like because they thought that it was a remark against Ambedkar. It was not a remark against Ambedkar. I said that, you know, that it is possible that there's some things in history which are very difficult to, some questions in history which might be very difficult to answer, right? But what is important is that we must try to understand the nature of caste. Nature meaning the historical nature of caste. Uh, what was the character of the Varna system? And I'll give you an example of a difficulty. Some people will say, oh, we can tell you what the nature of the Varna system is. Read the text, right? You will see that the text sometimes speak in different voices. If you read the Manuswati about the appointment of uh, important officials by the king, it's very, very cast obedient, right? If you read Shukraniti, Shukraniti actually says quite defiantly in very early stages, I think it is the 29th or the 30th shloka, which says that caste is not determined by, uh, by birth, it is determined by guna and karma, right? That is what your qualities are and what you have done with your qualities. And it does not simply leave it there. It consistently says to the king that when you are appointing somebody uh, to some job, don't do it on the basis of the caste that he comes from. Do it on the basis of, you know, what his guna and his karma are. So the texts themselves speak in different voices. And I think we should not then ask a question. Um, does Manusrati show us the true Hinduism or Shukraniti show, show us the true Hinduism. I think the true, true character of Hinduism is that, you know, it produces both the Manuswriti and the Shukraniti. And if we have historical means, we should try to understand, um, you know, what the relative influence of these two texts are. But there's a very big problem beyond that. Some people would say, what gives you the guarantee that what you get in the text is how the society actually ran? We have no guarantee, right? 
it's a very big question about what the nature of the text is. Is the text a kind of setting up a regulatory idea? That is, the text believes that if people act following the text, then the society would be like that, and that's how why the text is written in that prescriptive fashion, right? Or does the text actually give us a stylized picture of how the society actually operates? Very hard, you know, very, very hard to determine. Even these basic elementary questions. But my own thinking is that, you know, uh, that is what we should try to do. And for that, what we should do is we should be completely promiscuous in a certain sense. We should draw upon the work of people like Arif Sharma and others, you know, people like Ifran Habib, who doesn't go in that direction, but gives us a very strong economic analysis of the structure of the, of the Mughal Empire. We should turn to incomplete work, tradition, but not very much more, that you get in Kosambi. Well, since Kosambi takes uh, the category of feudalism, which I do not like very much, but he, he, look at what he does. He says that, you know, we have feudalism from above and below, right? So this is not something that he gets from any European Marxist. He believes that he should use the term feudalism, but he acknowledges simply by that distinction itself that you have to use that in a way which is very different from the way it has been used by the Europeans because our history is very different. And Kosambi, remember, Kosambi is a Sanskritist. He is deeply into the Sanskritic world and understands it. The other person who does that is uh, a man called Bhupendra Nadatta, who is uh, Vivekananda's younger brother, uh, <clears throat> who is very neglected. He has a book called The Dialectic of Land Relations, which is much more well-known because Marxists use that. But he has a book called Studies in Indian Social Politics, which actually tries to do something like this. You know, it's very incomplete. But I think if you look at the methodological thinking behind that, you know, that is very, very, uh, very appropriate for our kind of context. So, and the other thing is that, you know, I do not, if you do not believe that Marxism is a theory of everything, then you should not be embarrassed or troubled by the idea that when you try to understand something, you have to draw upon, you know, empirical literature, textual literature, analytic literature, which do not exist in Marx. You know, so this idea that when you are going into something, you are doing something which is non-Marx, right? I think is a very dangerous path. You know, what is non-Marx? Because uh, you must also understand something that, you know, Marxism, like any philosophical system, is both a doctrine and an alphabet in my way of thinking. Doctrine in the sense that, you know, Marx actually produces a certain doctrine uh, about, or a doctrinal form of ideas about capitalism. But by becoming influential and by being used by people in many, many different contexts, you know, his thinking actually becomes something like the alphabet, where people take different parts of the alphabet, they add other things to it and go in different directions, right? So it's inevitable that after some time, because a theory is extremely historically influential, it will be pulled in many different directions, right? And the question of whether something is Marxist or non-Marxist, I think beyond a point is reiterating. I don't think you should be stopped by somebody who says that, well, you are doing this, but it's not, it's not Marxist. Uh, uh, when uh, I used the phrase non-Marxist, I was uh, uh, drawing upon uh, the distinction that you make uh, in uh, the 83 work only of uh, uh, how Marx refers to India as uh, uh, as a contrast case. So I, I only used it uh, to make a contrast case and not uh, a methodological point, to make a methodological point out of it. So uh, you know, I, have, I have later on concluded uh, that uh, I do not say that, I made that point logically in the 1983 paper, but later on working particularly with people like Sheldon Pollock, 
I realized the difference between two ways of putting society side by side. You know, one is contrastive, the way it is done in Marx, where uh, the knowledge about the two societies is asymmetric, right? And truly comparative, where somebody who knows both the societies more or less symmetrically is now making uh, observations about what he finds similar and dissimilar, right? And uh, I did not see that so clearly when I was writing the uh, early paper. Uh, 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 should yeah. I do my final question or uh, should uh, Ishan? Uh, can Supri? you please read? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ishan, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. You're clearly audible. Okay, I'm just saying uh, we can have a second round and then maybe you can come. I had a related question, so then I can just. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, can I just make a follow-up remark, uh, Supri? If yeah, okay, go ahead. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, also, uh, what I've, uh, um, uh, um, I, in my time in JNU, uh, I've also had this discussion uh, where uh, someone who works in, uh, a senior of ours who works in, uh, uh, on electoral politics uh, remarked to me that even when you go out on the field, you will come across the fact that the social imagination of caste is different in eastern Uttar Pradesh to western Uttar Pradesh and significantly very different in uh, Punjab. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I also uh, was thinking on this line when you uh, were responding to the question. So, yeah, that, that, that's. Yeah, thank you. I'm not thank surprised. You. I'm, uh, I simply feel that, you know, that is what we should expect. <laughs> Just a question related to uh, uh, you know, the, the same paper, uh, yeah, the question is, the essay Marxism and Postcolonial Thinking ends with an interesting discussion on what is current modality of theory construction for Europe and non-European societies and what is required in its place. To make the argument clearly, you give us a, a schematic diagram and suggest that social sciences need to do theory from their own peculiar body of empirical knowledge just as European thinkers did in the 19th and the 20th century. Now, this is fine, but in the diagram, the diagram that what theory should be, so there, you know, to me, this seems to be in contention with, you know, uh, you know, what Dipesh Chakravarti in provincializing Europe, you know, the famous phrase uh, brings forth the contradictory relationship of you know, in provincializing Europe, he brings out the contradictory relationship of political modernity in India with European thought. Chakravarti suggested that simultaneous indispensability and yet the inadequacy of European thought in, in helping us to think through the various life practices that constitute the political as well as historical in India. However, in the diagram, you know, uh, the Europe is, you know, the, the three, you know, what it is required to be, you know, it's separate. So, so how do you, you know, respond to that i, I thought no, that I there think, was a difference i, I, mean, think, I mean i think there is a there is a difference yeah uh, but the difference you know we must also learn to think about our own thinking historically historically in the sense that i wrote and was clear about certain things in 83 when i wrote the status of marxism uh, writing on india i did not apply my mind to that kind of thing for a long time after that. Uh, there was also something, you know, anecdotal. In fact, some of my colleagues in, uh, some of the people I knew very well in England, they uh, said that you publish this paper in a history methodology journal, like history and theory. This was said to me by somebody who was one of the people associated with history and theory. I told him that, no, I don't want to do that. I want to publish it in India because this is uh, my conversation with Indian Marxists and not people like you who are not Marxists but interested in <coughs> thinking about historical methodology. Now, he told me that uh, he laughed and he said that, you know, I'm not a Marxist, but I've dealt with Marxists all my life. And I can tell you that, you know, Indian Marxists would not respond to your 
uh, to what you're saying because they would see that uh, either as something which is just very minimal it's a kind of minor logical matter about which you are giving a lot of attention and so therefore you would not actually uh, have a debate but whereas if you publish it in a journal like this then there would be lots of people who are not Marxist um, who might be interested in response <coughs> anyway so the Dipesh's book comes in 2000 right and I wrote um, this paper in 2017 it was published I think in 2018 so what I mean is that you know in these intervals between different pieces of writing there is a collective process of thinking about this you know, when Dipesh says something <coughs> When it is published, it does not remain Dipesh's thought in a certain sense. It starts circulating and people start responding to it. I think that there is a difference, uh, but it's a difference which I think is partly generated by uh, what Dipesh said. If you look at uh, one of my papers, which uh, I think it might have come out around the same time as Dipesh's book or probably a little later than Dipesh's book. Uh, I have an edited book with Sunil Kilnani called <coughs> Civil Society, History and Possibilities. And in one of my essays, in that I think I probably have two essays, in one of my essays, I say something which is very similar to what Dipesh said. I say there that, that, you know, when thinking about our societies, we cannot do without European thought, and we cannot do with European thought as well, within the sense that you know, simply staying within the limits of European thought is not enough. I think we should look more closely methodologically at Dipesh's book. And I think what Dipesh's book does is that it restates an argument, which I think is a very important and in some ways unusual argument initially stated by Habermas. <coughs> you know, anyone who reads the Marxist tradition and the hermeneutic tradition would immediately realize that there's a contradiction, there's a conflict between these two traditions. You know, one is a kind of more, more and more generalizing form of thinking, and the other one is a more and more particularizing form of thinking, you know, like this time. Now, Habermas said that uh, in order to understand the social world, we need to bring together two types of theorizing. One is the theorizing about the system. I think he has in mind more German thinkers who are his contemporaries, like Nicholas Luhmann, etc., who developed a highly sophisticated complex system theory. <coughs> and on the other hand, we must also apply a kind of philosophical thinking which thinks about the life world, which is a, a a phrase taken from Husserl, and it's the Husserl Heidegger kind of tradition. Now, I think what Dipesh uh, both says in his book and then does in his book follows that to some extent. That uh, you know, he said that we do history in two modes. One is the structure finding mode, <coughs> <coughs> and the other one is actually the specificity finding mode. So uh, to think of uh, what is happening in Bengal, we must understand the logic of capitalism, but we must also understand that, you know, so sociality in Bengal is affected by the forces of modernity, but produces something like the sociality of Adda, for instance, right? Which is very specific. Specific does not mean that it comes only from the logic of Bengali history. It is something which emerges through Bengali history responding to the logic of, you know, the rise of modernity, if not capitalism, right? Now, so if you look at the two parts of the Bishop's book, you'll see that there is also a consonance between what he declares methodologically, that we have to do theory in these two ways. And the first part talks about the structural thing and some of his <coughs> his problems with certain types of Marxism and their way of looking at the logic of capital. Logic of capitalism, I'm 
uh, not very uh, sympathetic to using a kind of philosophical terminology in uh, analyzing economic issues. So I think if we are talking about capitalism, it's much better to say logic of capitalism rather than logic of capital. And we were also discussing Aditya Nigam's work the other day, where I think it actually leads us into an unproductive um, area by simply the language deludes us into thinking that we are into a big question. You know, what is the outside of capital? What is the inside of capital, etc. I prefer using the sticking to the term capitalism because it reminds us constantly to, that we are thinking of an economic system <coughs> or an economic structure. So I, however, feel <coughs> that that is true, that it's true that we do history in these two modes very broadly. But first of all, the structural logics that we must use in our thinking uh, should be widened in the sense that it's not merely Marx who actually gives us a sense of the structural logics of modernity. I think he's the incomparable theorist of one structural logic, which he and Adam Smith, I think, understand the best, which is the rise of capitalism and the rise of industrialization, right? But there are other logics as well. You know, the logic of a certain kind of bureaucratization as, a, as central to the state. The logic of what the French would call, and I think Foucault is the, is the great theorist, but there are other theorists, for instance, there's a theorist called Gizo, whose work you will find many, many passages which prefigure some of the arguments that you get in Foucault. Um, what the French would call the process of etatisation, you know, statization, that all the disciplines in society are given over to the state, <coughs> right? Whereas earlier, disciplines, regularities, sanctions in society are not always given to the state. They are given to social mechanisms and social orders of various kinds. In some of my work, I have used the term social constitution, which is drawn from, from religious sources. You know, there's something like a social constitution for the Hindus and for the Muslims, etc., whose authority and whose longevity does not derive from its support from the state. And that's why my argument is that you know the pre-modern state in India should not be called a sovereign state, uh, at least sovereign not in the sense of Hobbes and Baudin or later John Austin, etc. I call it the state of subsidiarity rather than the state of sovereignty, right? So my point there would be that you know we probably now have to do more because you are quite right that if you stick to the Bishop's formulation then it seems that the theorization of the structural part must come from Europe, right? And the rich particularistic history part should be done in non-European society. But I, I, now I think I do not agree with that entirely. I think that, you know, there are two things that I would add to it. One is that with which I'm sure the British would not disagree, yeah. that uh, that uh, the structural logic itself about that we should be more um, more expansive and look for that kind of structural logic in Tocqueville, in Weber, and other uh, Foucault is much easier to render compatible with Marxism because Foucault partly comes from a Marxian genealogy through Althusser. Uh, so we should expand that. But on the other hand, I think what we should do is the moment we engage with our history more fully, you know, then I think we should be able to find regularities you know, which are drawn from this corpus of historical knowledge. You know, so uh, I think this would be somewhat different from yeah. the methodological position that you get in, in the past. But I think the important thing is that, you know, people like you who are young, who are just beginning their career, since you can see this question, you know, uh, part of the, um, you know, part of the success in thinking is to achieve a good question. If you achieve a good question, I think then going into something which is very productive becomes easier. This is, I think, a good question. You know, I'm glad that you see this question. 
but you should read carefully and see the suggestion that you get, let's say, in the page, as you currently see that, in Kola and Shannal's work on capitalism. Yeah. Right. Some of Partha's work, but uh, Kola and Shannal's work, Partha has also commented on Kola and Shannal's work, and so therefore he has something to say about this. My, uh, whatever I have written, Aditya Nigam's new book, I think, picks up, I think correctly, the idea that this, the overarching question is the theory of modernity. But within that, there are three theories that we need to rethink. One is the theory of the state. Second is the theory of society and religion. And the third is the theory of the economy and capitalism. Right. So the question would be that don't we need to develop you know, structural ideas or structural generalization about these things and not depend on European theory. Okay. Um, uh, Pankaj? Hello, Pankaj? Yes, yes. Hello. You can queue in. Yeah. Yeah. Who? Who? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I like this. Oh, okay. Ankit, Ankit, where? Ankit? Ankit Singh? Is it there? I think, uh, yeah, 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 I'm here, I'm here. So my question is also related somehow to that part which we're discussing uh, in relation to post-Marx Marx and post-colonial thinking. Somehow, Professor Kaviraz, while reading this article, I got a sense that you are trying, though you have responded partially in, in Supriyo's and Nishan's answer as well, while responding to them. But I got a sense that you are attempting to draw a kind of indigenous methodology of theory. I mean, to what extent would you, I mean, I don't know, I, I'm just, I got a sense of it. I and mean, to what extent do you agree with this notion that the chart, that the graph which you have designed is a kind of uh, a method for us to push ourselves toward indigenous uh, political theory, I mean, indigenous method of doing political theory. And secondly, if that remains the case, what about the challenges that we generally uh, get in kind of doing this indigenous political theory, uh, say from, from Gadamer, who will, or from, from Professor Mahajan, who will write, write, write really, outrightly reject it, saying that, there is nothing called indigenous political theory, rather we are all are the part of the same tradition, taking clue from Gadamer and the rest. So how do you respond to that? Yeah. <coughs> you know, indigenous can mean very different things. And, uh, you know, I'm very influenced by Gadamer in my thinking, because I think, you know, Gadamer is one of the, uh, one of the finest and deepest thinkers in terms of reflection on historicity. But um, I think you can use Gadamer in a different direction as well. But let me uh, do it somewhat differently by focusing on the uh, meaning of the of the term indigenous. You know, I recently had a debate. I think it will come out next year in a book with uh, James Tully, you know, the Canadian political theorist. He wrote a very, very interesting essay called Deep Parochializing Political Theory. And uh, there's a journal called the Journal of World Philosophy. They initially invited, I think, four or five of us to write a short response to his paper, which we did. And then um, it wanted uh, some of us to write long responses. I wrote a long response, and Tali has now written a response to our response. And the question of the indigenous, you know, comes up there. I'll give you two, three examples from colonialism. You know, colonialism affects different societies in very different ways. And take the example of um, the Canadian indigenous people, they basically withdrew from the world that European and white settler modernity created in their country. They simply retreated 
into a world of their own. But by retreating, they retained, you know, their cognitive world. They retained the kind of completely unruptured cognitive world. And people like Tali, they have actually now set up institutes and and uh, centers through which they try they can explore, you know, the epistemic resources of that kind of thinking about nature, about society, etc. In our case, the effect of colonialism was very different. The effect of colonialism disrupted our connection to our past. But I argue that, you know, indigenous can mean, I would say now, responding to your question, which sets off interesting idea. Indigenous can mean three different things. You know, indigenous can mean that I produce an argument whose conceptual resources are essentially taken from past Indian thought. So I apply, let us say, the categories of Nyaya, right? Or I apply categories of some, you know, older form of uh, Indian philosophical thought. That would be indigenous in one way. I don't think that is easy for two reasons. One is that, uh, you know, our disconnection from that, that in order to use them, we have to be sufficiently fluent in them, and we are not. Secondly, there's a deeper question, that the social world that those philosophies encountered, and in response to which those philosophies emerged, was a social world which is completely different from our social world. So I have tried to read, let's say, the Arthashastra, the Manusmriti, the Shukraniti, etc., carefully, but I think it is impossible to develop a theoretical response to our world, you know, the political world in which we live, by drawing upon resources from that tradition. That is the second reason why, um, you know, uh, it's difficult to draw something from there. However, in my engagement with Tali, I have said that there is a second Indian tradition. The second Indian tradition is the modern Indian tradition. You know, tradition which emerges from Ramon Roy through, uh, you know, Indian thinkers down to Tibor, Nehru, Ambedkar, etc., who at one level are using a language, not Tagore and Gandhi, but take somebody like Ambedkar, you know, using a language which is completely Western, right, in a certain sense. He had no problem about using the language of liberalism. But look at his thinking, not just the language. He is thinking about a structure of inequality, which is completely sui generis, completely specific, unique to India. So you might apply the language of liberalism, but the thought that it produces by engaging with a structure, which is not a structure of class, but a structure of caste, with its own specific history, is a body of thought, which is very different from the body of thought that you get in, in Europe. So I would not say that Ambed, because Ambedkar uses the liberal language, Ambedkar's thought is uh, derivative, right? Derivative is a term which can also be used in different ways, but you understand what I mean. So I think when we say that we should use Indian resources of Indian thought, it can mean at least these two things. You know, it can mean using resources from Indian thought of the past, pre-modern past. Secondly, distinctly, it can mean using resources from the Indian thought of the modern past, with which we do not have to struggle. We do that all the time. Because half the thinking that we do about caste, about democracy, etc., you know, some of those ideas are taken from Gandhi, Nehru, Ambedkar, you know, Savarkar, whatever. You know, these are all, uh, in parts of an Indian tradition engaging with modernity. And I've expanded that in my paper by saying, drawing upon a very Marxist idea that the world of the world of modernity that was created by Europe is a contradictory world. Contradictory in the sense that it has different places and the experience in different those different places that totally different than incommensurable. 
So the colonial experience of modernity, which our thinkers like Bonkim, et cetera, understood very, very clearly. Bonkim understands it in one way. Tadama and Auroji understands it in a different way. But if the experience of modernity is contradictory, it produces one kind of experience in Europe and a very different kind of experience in the colonial world, then the reflection coming out of the colonial world, right, is something which is quite different. Right. And so this can be the second meaning of drawing upon something which is Indian. You can see that I'm avoiding using the term indigenous because indigenous can be misleading because it can mean all these things. But what I'm saying now is that there's also a possibility of a third source of Indian thought or third kind of Indian thought. Suppose you and I, you know, my generation and your generation much more, engage with the Indian past, you know, much more uh, seriously, right? Everybody in your generation become fluent in Sanskrit and Persian, right? Do not misunderstand. It's not easy. You know, we should not, uh, this is, there's a kind of chatter which I find irritating. A lot of people would say, we shall do this, we shall do that, etc. It's not easy to do. You know, Sanskrit is not an easy language to learn. And even if you learn Sanskrit, you know, learning Sanskrit to a point where you can read Abhinava Gupta or Rupa Goswami or, uh, you know, Gangesh is very hard. If you have gone to Mathur Dabhavan and learned German, you would not be able to give a lecture on the philosophy of right. You, know, you have to read the conceptual philosophical language behind that. But suppose we are able to do this. You know, this is why I think it's absolutely central to link it with a reform of education. I want you people, you know, to get an education which is very different from the education that I was given, right? If you get an education where you know Sanskrit and Persian, right, you engage with that body of text and history, right? Because text is not always an unfailing, unfailing guide to history, you know, to practice. So you, get access to the textual world and also text independently into the historical world, right? And then we start theorizing about that world by following the lead that we get in, let us say, Bhude Mukhapadhyay or Bhupendra Dattar or Kosambi, right? And then we develop a body of theoretical thinking. Would that not be Indian? You know, I would not use the term indigenous, you know, because indigenous is vague. Normally what I would do is, I would actually preserve indigenous for the first type of thinking, right? And uh, I'll give you an example. For instance, the paper that I wrote, uh, under pressure from somebody, you know, who uh, is younger than me, but in some ways my teacher, um, Aurindam Chakravarti, uh, who is a great Sanskritist and uh, philosopher, uh, he said that, you know, you have uh, engaged with the Kashmiri theory for some time. So why don't you apply your mind to the question of representation? Right. So I draw the concept of representation from these two people. If you read that paper, you will see that what I do is I lift it from them and I present them in a kind of abstract theoretical way. And then I try to use it for understanding how the representation process works in a democracy, right? And so what would you call this kind of thinking? Is it indigenous? Uh, some people would say that, you know, uh, would throw in something which is even more problematic, authenticity. Right? Now, if being true to your own historical experiences, authenticity or indigeneity, then of course it is indigenous. But if indigeneity or authenticity means that you go back into the conceptual resources and language of pre-modern Indian tradition, it's very, very hard to do. It's practically impossible to do in the uh, case of scholars of my generation. I suspect, uh, you people are better judges of that. I suspect that it has become even more difficult in your generation. 
at least I know a little mattering of Sanskrit so that I can I can read Sanskrit poetry. I can at least read uh, some parts of Abhinava. I don't know how many of you can actually do that fluently, right? Fluently. But I do not see any reason why. You know, what the Europeans can do, or the Westerners can do, you can go to a big university, good university, and you can study Aristotle with an Aristotle scholar inside the university, right? And then you can decide, like Martha Nussbaum, or like uh, Alexander McIntyre, or like Charles Feder, that you would use concepts from Aristotle to engage with some of the questions that we face today, right? I, you know, this is the meaning of colonialism, that, you know, those people have a much deeper distanciation from their past, in a certain sense, you know, from their tradition historically, but not, epistemic, not epistemically, not intellectually. You come to Colombia and you can go to the classics department and you can get scholars who are some of the best scholars in the world working not on Aristotle vaguely, but on Aristotle metaphysics or Aristotle posterior analytics or something like that. And you can learn from them. Think of, you know, think of JNU or think of any Indian university. What we have done to our world of knowledge, right? This is the meaning of colonialism. You know, we do not understand the meaning of colonialism. The important thing is that if we understand the meaning of colonialism, that becomes a step to overcome it. But we don't understand it. And, uh, you know, I do not know whether you have supporters of BJP amongst you. I do not mind. But uh, my objection to them is that, you know, uh, the people who are supporters of the BJP or supporters of Hindutva, I think they're actually much worse in some ways. In fact, they're at least equally bad. Because when the BJP government first came, uh, uh, Murli Manohar Joshi, I felt that he might actually start a serious attempt to say to the university system that we must have proper knowledge of Sanskrit-based knowledge system inside the modern university. Nothing happened. You know, Vedic mathematics and astrology. It actually shows that the people who do that, they do not understand what the Sanskrit world is. So I think we need to, uh, but I, I'm an optimist in the long-term sense. I do not see why people like you cannot do it if you decide that you want to do it. You have time, I do not have much time. And people who are after you, you know, who are now entering college or JNU, if students in Berkeley can claim can say that, you know, we want to do uh, a good course on, on the Ramayana, right? Or we want to do a good course on Nyaya. Why can't people make that demand in the university system? But you will, you will notice one thing. Suppose, you know, Arun is here. Arun is the dean of one of the very big universities in India. Suppose a group of people comes to Arun and says that we want to do an intensive course on something like this. He, it would not be easy for him, you know, to put up a serious course. It might be accidental that in his university there might be a good scholar who can do that. But to offer instruction in the entire range of Sanskrit knowledge systems, if you look at uh, Sheldon Pollock's edited book, you know, Sanskrit knowledge system before the coming of colonialism. And you go to a vice chancellor and say that I want to be taught that. It's not easy. You cannot teach that. And this is the effect of, of colonialism in our society. So indigeneity, I think indigeneity is an interesting, important problem. I do not agree with the idea that, you know, uh, reading Gadamer would not take us in the direction of our tradition. I think on the contrary. Um, let me give you an example which is a Gadamer-like example. And it's also a German example. I wrote a paper a long time back, I don't remember if I sent it to you as part of this discussion, which was called Marxism and the Darkness of History. Did I send it? Yeah. Yeah, so you Marxism, yes, sir, yes, sir, you did. 
Marxism and the doctrine of history. You know, I had a very close German friend, a very uh, distinguished Sanskritist. I think he initially started out with Vedic uh, Sanskrit, but later on became very interested in Vaishnavism, particularly Vaishnavism in Odisha. And, you know, art, craft, Vaishnava thinking, etc. His name was Heinrich von Stietenkron. He died a few years back. He told me when he read that paper, something which I found very startling, but this is this goes directly into Garava. He said, Shudipta, you, uh, you are troubled, I can see, that you are troubled by two things which you see as deficiencies in Indian Marxism and also Marxism in general. There is a kind of cognitive arrogance about history that uh, Marxists believe that they've got the script of history in, in their hand. So they, in a sense, have the knowledge of the future in advance. And he said that you are more bothered by something else, that this cognitive arrogance in some way is also linked to a certain kind of moral arrogance. That uh, when we see somebody who is not a Marxist, we not merely really feel that he's a fool, uh, he doesn't understand history. If you read the Communist Manifesto, he could have understood it very easily. So he doesn't understand history. But also you impute motives, you know, you uh, see them as people who are guilty of moral failing in some way. And he said that it's quite clear that you respond very strongly against that, that uh, against the cognitive arrogance and the associated moral arrogance. Up to this, there's no uh, surprise. He said that you think that you got this kind of thinking from Pascal. I think there's a reference to Pascal in that paper, I've forgotten now. So he said, but I, I'm convinced that you don't get it from Pascal. Uh, he said, I do not mean that you, you haven't read Pascal. Obviously you have, you are uh, impressed by him, influenced by him. But he said that I think that there is a tradition of thought which is much closer to you and which run through your thinking without you knowing it. Because he said that the line of thinking which is very deep and elaborate in thinking about the question of moral arrogance is Buddhism. So he said that it's not that you have read Buddhism. He said, but some of those ideas from Buddhism actually filter into your thoughts through Tagore, through many ideas which circulate in your culture, and then in Tagore, there are uh, arguments which are similar. Tagore himself might not have known that, you know, uh, originates or comes from Buddhism, but the ideas are there. So he said, therefore, I've also uh, remarked somewhere, um, this was brought up in the Columbia discussion the other day, that uh, the author is not always the best judge of his own thinking, and particularly the sources of his own thinking. And I was convinced by uh, Staten Kron that he was right, that I did not realize where that idea sort of came from, you know, in my thinking. So I think the question of tradition, and remember, uh, the reason I find Garama so interesting is that is the displacement of the concept of tradition in Garama. You know, remember that in Gadawa, the concept of tradition, which is very minimal, but extremely powerful, is if you ask me, what is my tradition? A Gadawa answer to that question would be the thoughts through which you think. Right, simple. The thoughts through which you think. That is your tradition. So however much you might claim that, you know, I'm an Indian, I'm this, I'm that, etc. If all the thoughts through which you think have come from Marx and Weber and, and uh, you know, Foucault and Agamben, then that is your tradition. You know, learn to see what your tradition is. Tradition is thought through which you think, right? But Gadamer would also say that we are not always very clear about the thoughts through which we think. So it, in my case, you know, think about the complexity of this in my case, after what Heinrich told me, that it's true that I thought of this cognitive and moral arrogance 
uh, through reading Pascal. But he was saying that, you know, in my own thinking, there are two layers. You know, one is the layer which about which I'm much more aware. But there is a layer about which I'm not very aware, but which is very deep because, you know, of my reading of Tagore and my love of Tagore. You know, those ideas have actually seeped into my own thinking, right? They are my thoughts now, right? I cannot escape them because they have become mine, right? And so therefore, uh, Gadamer would say that when you try to understand your tradition, and you also have to make a judgment about whether your tradition exists in you or not, it's not a simple question, right? What Street and Corner is telling me that what I told you just now is partly wrong. Because if I uh, question you aggressively, and uh, if I look at one of your papers, and I say that this comes from Marx, this comes from Weber, this comes from Foucault, this comes from uh, Tocqueville, this comes from somewhere else, etc. Look and see, your tradition has nothing Indian about it. Your tradition is entirely, uh, entirely European. Gadamer will say that, you know, that might be true at one level. But tradition works, you know, unbeknownst to ourselves in a certain sense, sometimes actually at the back of our thinking. And so if we have that, you know, what is the conclusion from what Stephen Cron tells me about my using an idea which might be Vaishnavite or Buddhist idea, which has come to me because I'm an irreligious man. It hasn't come to me through my respect for Buddhism or Vaishnavism. It has come to me through my respect for Tagore. Right? But this would show that what I should do should be what can be called a kind of anamnetic exercise. You know, anamnetic meaning something about which I have forgotten, right? I must understand what, where it has come from, right? So he told me that you should, uh, people like you should do an anamnetic exercise about the sources of your thinking. So the question of tradition is not easy. The question of tradition, the question of indigeneity, they're not easy. And they're important to think about because they're not easy. You know, if we could simply uh, say that something is right, something is wrong, it's not worth thinking about. Pankaj? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Could you, could you, could you, could you, yeah. So, I, the question is this. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, Pankaj, wait. Somebody ask her son to be brief in comments. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll do that. Uh, uh, sir also yeah, uh, Pradeep sir can go next uh, after Pankaj. Yeah, yeah. Then I'll do. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, good evening, sir. This is Pradeep Naik from Bhubaneswar, yeah. sir. I, I had attended your... Uh, I was a student in sir. Enfield, sir. You taught us methodology. He is not there. He's, 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 going he's to not there. He, uh, uh, he's perhaps uh, in his washroom, sir. He's not uh, at the desk. No, I'm here. I'm here. No, no. no. no Kaviraj, sir, is no, not no. at his desk. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> that question about... Uh, you know, dangers, responsibility, and consequence can be also asked. I mean, keeping uh -huh, on to the that are happening. Uh -huh, but, uh -huh. but later on, maybe, maybe later on. Just giving a cue to Pankaj. Ramarji's Jain students are not challenging Kaviraj, unlike my batch. <laughs> I, I think, think they are. are. I mean, Supriyo yeah. and uh, I mean, they have they have interesting insights about things. They are coming with questions. I think. I didn't challenge him directly, you were asking gently and such. I would have to say it. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's a, a sort so of institutional, 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 institut
<laughs> and they are too intimate by your wish yeah <laughs> yeah we don't have a dean of for social sciences like you <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> so should I start? Yeah. So Pankaj, you can let him come. Let go him in. Come. Yeah, yeah. Yes, come. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, come. So, no. Yeah. So Pankaj, you can go is, in. Yeah, yeah. That you are critical of the idea of transition, which were there in the modernization and other theories, and tries yeah. to grasp the specificities of post-colonial social formation. In this context. The category of passive revolution was used to grasp the specificity of post-colonial capitalism. In this regard, Kalyan Sanyan's work, The Thinking Capitalist Development, has shown the ways in which, while he does not make any specific argument against your position, but he shows that the proponents of passive revolution are not able to go beyond the narrative of transition because they accept that the full-scale capitalist transformation is in principle possible but as the need for legitimization under the conditions of democracy does not allow the society to pass through the painful phase of primitive accumulation therefore the state has to preserve the traditional or pre-capital but sanyal problematizes this assumption and asks in his own words i will quote if it were possible to use the kind of coercive power the process of primitive accumulation calls for would there have been a full-scale transition to capitalism? Implicit in this argument is an affirmative answer to this question. It implicitly assumes that the success of primitive accumulation depends only on the presence of an appropriate structure and modality of power. So, how would you respond to this criticism and to what extent passive revolution as a conceptual category is adequate in grasping the species of contemporary capitalism in India? This is the question. Yeah, again, I think it's a very good question. Uh, and let me answer it in two different levels. One is a purely conceptual level. I now believe, I don't remember if I have written about it. I probably have notes, but not uh, published it. Um, there was some discussion on Gramsci where uh, we were discussing this question. <coughs> I feel that um, some of us were attracted to the passive revolution idea because the passive revolution idea is based on the idea of pluralization of power of capitalist modernity. You know, because if you think of it from the point of view of Marxist intellectual history, what Gramsci is doing is he's not making a direct reference to Marx's uh, position that uh, there are two uh, different trajectories in Europe. One is what he calls a really revolutionary trajectory in France and Germany, sorry, England and France. And then the late capitalist trajectory, which is politically very different, you know, where the state actually does the task of the uh, capitalist revolution instead of the capitalist class. So passive revolution, I think, is an attempt by Gramsci to pick on that idea, which is very sketchy in Marx, and then to flesh it out a bit more so that it becomes more of an explanation of what is happening in uh, Italy, Germany, uh, Russia. So wherever capitalism uh, emerges later, uh, it faces this kind of, it, assume this kind of form. So I think we found that attractive and uh, used it on India. I think I later on revised my understanding of how to learn from Gramsci. You know, I felt that one way of learning from Gramsci is to say that there's something, a conceptualization or an argumentative string, which is there in Gramsci, which I can apply to India to understand what has happened here. That is what the borrowing of the phrase passive revolution does, at least in my work. I think two of us use it very centrally, not just the two of us. I think uh, Oshok Shen uh, uh, did it, and he was somebody who was very influential to me and Pakhto at the same time. 
uh, but Partho and I both used uh, passive revolution. Partho probably a bit more. I used it in a couple of papers, and then I don't use it any anymore. But I uh, let me make two other points very quickly. <coughs> I later on felt that you know this was not uh, the best way of learning from Gramsci. To learn from Gramsci, what I should do is to try to see what Gramsci is doing to his received theory in order to make it applicable, in order to make it uh, you know, appropriate for the differences that he finds in Italy. And I have a paper which Partho is going to publish in a collection that he is uh, editing. It's called Gramsci and Different Kinds of Difference. And it suggests that Gramsci is the great theorist of difference inside Marxism, because he not merely says, notes that uh, there are different trajectories in Europe between the revolutionary and the non-revolutionary passive revolution path, but he follows it up by saying that even inside Italy, there is a difference between the North and the South. So it's very, very, insistent on the southern question, which is the registration of difference, right? Then look at his very great attention to, not to Christianity, not to religion, but to Catholicism. He could have said that we should try to understand religion. He does not, right? He could have said that we should try to understand the influence of Christianity in, in popular life. He does not. He says we must try to understand the influence of Catholicism in popular life. What does it mean? It means that religion is a very vague term, very abstract. Christianity is a vague term because it's abstract. The form in which religion affects the life of the people in Italy, particularly in the South, peasant society, which you must understand, right, is Catholicism. So the use of the term Catholicism rather than Christianity or religion is a very important use. You know, this is what I mean, that we must actually learn to read closely and we must learn to read every word, you know, not just even a sentence, but every word. In fact, think about why it is Catholicism, Catholicism, Catholicism in Gramsci. You know, why not Christianity? Why not religion? Because he's a theorist of difference. What does it tell me? It means that I must understand then what are the specificities, peculiarities of the Indian historical form. I decided there are three. One is the question of language. I wrote a paper to clarify it to myself. I wrote a paper called uh, Writing Speaking Being a long time back. I gave it as a kind of, it was the, uh, I think, a keynote to the German Historical Congress or something long, long time back. But it's about uh, language. The second is about caste. So I wrote several uh, papers on caste to try to clarify to myself, you know, how should I uh, try to look at the complexity of caste in Indian social form? And finally, religion. Religion meaning uh, the proximate religion which was giving me trouble, which is the religion of Hindutva. Hindu nationalism. But then, when I looked at Hindu nationalism, I found that, you know, the modern Hindu nationalist form of Hinduism is very different from Hinduism in the past, in which I, of course, follow to some extent the distinction that Ashish Nandi made between religion as, um, religion as ideology and religion as... Uh, Rules and principles. No. Uh, no. No, no, that religion. was... I, ideology and religion are something. Um, religion anyway. faith. Faith, faith, faith. Yeah, faith. faith. Religion and faith and religion and ideology. So I modify, because that's not where I wanted to put emphasis on, but I called it thick and thin religion. I wrote a paper in which I tried to do that. So the way I responded to Gramsci was to say that what is interesting in Gramsci is how he receives a theoretical model and then modifies it to adapt it to his historical circumstances, right? Which is the study of Catholicism, which is the study of peasant society, etc. 
So what are the things which actually differentiate my historical formation from others? And I felt that it's linguistic diversity, the order of caste and religion. And so I felt that what I did after that was in a certain sense, you know, following Gramsci in a more meaningful way than simply taking an idea from Gramsci and applying it to India. Finally, the question of transition. I think, you know, I like Colin Chandler's book very much because I think because of the enterprise, because that is exactly the kind of thing that we should do in whichever field in which we try to understand it. I'll break it up into two parts because both these were implicit in your, the remarks that you made during your question. One is I think is a very simple but profound problem of the relation between democracy and capitalism. And I wrote a couple of papers on democracy and development a long time back, which are both printed in one of the, one of the uh, essay collection, I think probably trajectory of the state or something. Uh, there are two essays on democracy and development, where I argue that uh, essentially the same point that, uh, you know, capitalism could develop so unobstructed and untrammeled in Europe, initially precisely because there was no democracy. Once capitalism was instituted and it developed, democracy rose essentially as an anti-capitalist political practice. This is why I'm actually uh, unwilling to use uh, indiscriminately this idea of bourgeois democracy, bourgeois democracy, right? I think democracy actually owes much more to the proletariat than to the bourgeoisie. But anyway, uh, it arises and then it actually modifies the power of capitalism, right? And produces the kind of equilibrium, uh, which ultimately produces the welfare state, right? Now, in non-European societies, if you take South Korea, you'll find something very interesting. South Korean capitalism begins, develops untrammeled by democracy initially. You know, very fast, absolutely irresistible growth of capitalism. It reaches a high degree of maturity in a certain sense, a very quick time. Right. South Korean capitalism is comparable to, let's say, the rise of capitalism in Germany in the uh, early 20th century kind of thing. But then after it reaches a certain kind of capitalist maturity, for very similar reasons inside South Korean society, you have development of a demand for democracy. And remember that we should not um, ignore them because they are people who were actually able to put a president in, in jail, um, you know, through a judicial process. Very, very interesting, right? Very interesting. So the question is, it is linked, I think, to some extent with my speculation about sequence, right? And so I agree with Kulan Shannal. Basically what he's saying is that development of capitalism would be hampered. This is, remember, this is also the point that Partho makes from very different angles when it talks about political society, that people who are poor, people who are indigent, right, they cannot be ignored completely. And because of that, the state has to make compromises with them, which he tried to capture through the idea of a political society. But I think it goes to the center of a very simple thing, which Colin Chandel says, with which I agree, that if you have democratic politics, under our circumstances, it can impede the development of capitalism. But if you can get rid of democracy, then of course it can uh, help the development of capitalism, right? So I do not deny that. But I do not accept, this is a point which Aditya Nizam has also discussed at great length in his book. I think the last substantive chapter is about capitalism and Colin Shannal. And he also touches on Colin Shannal uh, you know, critical remarks about, he doesn't mention us directly, but, you know, I suspect that it's, again, the Oshukshin, Partho, me kind of use of uh, passive revolution. I do not see uh, the use of the second trajectory 
and an alternative trajectory of capitalism and being necessarily transitionist. You know, transitionist basically means a teleological understanding that there is a kind of fully developed form of capitalism and all development of capitalism is ultimately tending towards that. I don't think anybody today would actually hold on to that idea either empirically or theoretically because there's uh, an essay in Althusser's uh, Lenin and philosophy uh, where I'm forgetting what the title of that essay is but I was very attracted to that essay because what it seemed to me to do was something like this. You know, he was saying that to say that there's a logic of history, the author is unnecessarily anti-Hegelian. Uh, I don't think one should be anti-Hegelian to that extent. You know, he has an anti-Hegelian prejudice. So an idea which I think uh, really derives from Hegel, he would not acknowledge that. But anyway, there's no doubt that, you know, Hegel has an Hegel has a teleological view of history in a complicated sense. In a complicated sense that Hegel believes that history has ended. So there's an end of history. And from here, you can actually look back. I tell the students that Hegel says something which I think is true. That Hegel says that um, it's like driving a car in a road uh, in the dark where the lights are the, at the back of your car. So. When you are driving, you cannot see what lies uh, ahead. You can probably see it very, very vaguely and tentatively. But once you are passed, you know, then of course you have the headlights at the back. So you can see very clearly, you know, what happened, uh, what happened and why it happened, etc. I think there's a lot of truth in that, right? But coming back to the question of teleology, what attracted me in that essay by Althusser is that I don't think he, uh, he, says it very clearly, but I think there is an attempt to say something like this, that there is a logic in history. In the sense that if you think of history as uh, uh, infinite Lego, uh, sorry, not Lego, infinite puzzle, right? The cardboard puzzle that children make, so that, you know, uh, there is a logic that is to one particular uh, piece of the puzzle, you can fit only another piece, right? So there is a kind of logic in that. But the logic of history is somewhat like that, that when you look back, you can understand why things have happened. And because there's a process logic, you know, I make a distinction in my thinking and writing between a logic of processes and the logic of events. We cannot predict, predict them. You know, we cannot actually sufficiently capture the logic of events, but we can sufficiently capture the logic of processes, right? And through capturing the logic of process, we can say that it will go in that direction or this direction. This is what we can do to try to either facilitate it or stop it or something like that, right? But it is not an idea where there is a kind of end to which this process of you know, building the puzzle tends that it would ultimately get there. You know, it simply goes on, but it is, think of it this way, that, you know, it is a puzzle which we are making at the same time. So you have made some pieces of the puzzle, right? And the puzzle ends here now. And you have given me the task of making, not having ready-made pieces, but making the pieces which would fit into the puzzle that you have created up to now. What do I have to do? I have to shape the inside of part of the of the puzzle of the pieces, you know, according to the shape that you have left behind. You know, according to the shape that you have left behind. But I can actually have a shape on the other side, you know, on the future side, which is my own, you know, which is not dictated by the shape that you force me to create, you know, on your side on the past side, if the puzzle has a past side and a future side, right? So I do not think that believing in a logic of history <coughs> necessarily commits you to a technology in that strong sense. I think there can be a belief in the process of history <coughs> or even a belief in the logic of history, which is non-teleological in this sense which I think Colin Chandler does not 
uh, acknowledged sufficiently. You know, I never interacted. I knew him very vaguely. Partha, of course, knew him very, very well. Um, and most of my friends in Calcutta knew him, but I didn't know him at all. I actually, accidentally, I knew his father very well as a friend of my father. His father was a professor of Bengali in <coughs> the Raj College in, in Baltimore. And I now actually look at one of his works very often, very closely. He actually did a very good translation of a section of the Abhinava Bharati, you know, the Rasa Sutra section of the Abhinava Bharati. He did a Bengali translation of that, which I use all the time. But I didn't know Kulan Shannal very well. So this would be my, you know, response to your question. I think your questions are very good, very, very important questions. We can have Pradeep, sir. Pradeep Nayak, sir. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. So, good evening, sir. So, in fact, sir, uh, I had attended uh, uh, my classes in Enfield. Uh, your, I attended my classes, you know, in Enfield days, sir. You taught us methodology. Yeah, nice no, uh, you, I can, I can, I can, I can recognize you now. Yes, <laughs> sir. Sir, that, in fact, I had read that uh, your article with Marx in India. So, now, Few days back, we had a discussion with a, a professor um, uh, rural India, um, this is Jodka. So somehow we carried forward the discussion that Mars, because you have rightly concluded that the uh, Mars methodology is very um, analysis of India is not. It's, it's it can be discarded. It's not a methodology, not a scientific way. It can, India is not struck in time. It is unchanging. Is that? So, in fact, we have discussed that in rural India is changing. So much, so much in Marx prediction is wrong. So, another way, some people say, and I think you have taught in class, that in, even in Max Weber, that we have some entrepreneurial classes, you know, spirit of capitalism here. So, you have Marx and Weber. And so, I'm asking for another question because I have left uh, academy, but still somehow. So, what way you find the trajectory? Because some people have started writing James, Luck, and other. Some feudalism question gone, feudalism gone, landlordism gone, Indian rural society different heading. Though, as Sanyal and uh, Parth the Tajji, they speak different way because of, of, of logic of as a young friend said, that pressure of democracy and all these things. So, India has to, the state has to uh, do compromise. So, again, to what way? The Maxwell vision and this is Marx and India, the vision, how you find it? Because I read your rules and Indra and your Indian politics that time. So, kindly conceptualize that. And secondly, the changing rural India, emerging present context. Where are you located? This? Again, if you revisit, if somebody asks you to revisit your writing, sir, on rural India. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I have to write two books to answer your two questions. <laughs> but, uh, I think, you know, uh, when we uh, try to follow great thinkers, um, I don't think uh, we are committed to following everything that they write. And particularly um, in case of people like Marx or Hegel, who um, write or think primarily about their world, but sometimes also write about our world. I don't think we should give equal weight to the two types of writing. I think we should try to learn from what they write about their world because that is something that they understand better, they understand well, and I think their thinking is right uh, about that world. And in my paper on Marx, I wrote something which was unpopular at that time. A lot of people were very Annoyed, but I think uh, I still stick to that. That when Marx was writing about India, he was thinking about Europe. He was trying to solve a question, which was a question about the development of capitalism in Europe. And he used India as a contrast. And the fact that Marx thought that uh, Indian village society never changed, I think it was not his fault. Uh, I think it's an interesting question. He took on trust, you know, the writing about India that he found in British writers like James Fear and others. <coughs> it's an interesting <coughs> intellectual history question to ask 
why did they think that there was no private property in Indian villages? Because they went to the Indian villages, they asked uh, peasants, uh, do you, is this your land? And they would say, yes, this is our land, this is my land. They would ask, do you cultivate this land? Yes, I cultivate this land. Do you use the product from this land? Yes, I use the product from this land. Ultimately, they would ask, can you sell this land to me? And invariably, they would say that I cannot sell this land to you. And Europeans, because they worked with the capitalist conception of property of their time, they then felt that you know these people were not, they did not think very clearly, right? So there is no private property because for them, alienability, your ability to sell your property is so central to the definition of property that they thought that there's no property in land in India. If they were more sophisticated, and if they allowed the possibility that in different cultures, in different historical stages, property can be defined in very different ways, at least substantially different ways, then they would not have said that. And if they did not say that, you know, Marx would, Marx, it was not Marx's fault, because Marx never claimed that he came and saw this about the Indian village. He simply took it for granted from somebody whose knowledge he trusted. And that knowledge was not very trustworthy. But again, what I'm trying to show is that we should not simply say that they're wrong. We should try to understand why they went wrong. And I think this is the logic of why they went wrong. They applied to India a conception of property, which was taken from a particular stage of development of capitalism in Europe, particularly in India. In, in and uh, so I think when we turn to Indian history, uh, this is what makes it very difficult. We abstractly understand that, you know, Indian society must have changed. But sometimes we have a problem of lack of uh, sources. Uh, the kind of record that the Europeans have from, let's say, 13th, 14th century through village parish records and things like that, we have nothing like that. Um, some of the historical record that we have, for instance, of cases, judicial cases, right? Those are in Persian, because those are actually part of the uh, records of either the Mughal Empire or the, uh, the uh, you know, Nawabi of Awad or places like that, right? Uh, for instance, if you take something very interesting, we had a student here, she did her PhD with Sheldon Pola on Sanskrit production in the Mughal court. You know, so she studied all the books that were written in Sanskrit in the courts of Akbar, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan. After Shah Jahan, no Sanskrit books were produced in the Mughal court under Aurangzeb, right? But they produced 50 or 55 books um, in the Mughal court during this time. And the interesting thing is that if you want to understand a whole lot of things, about uh, the Brahmin intelligentsia, right? Or many other things, you would not get it from the Hindu sources because Hindu sources are not very, Hindu sources are not interested in chronology, normally. There are some people, for instance, if you read Abhinav Gupta, he actually gives the date when the book is written, who is his mother, who is his father, who he started with, uh, and things like that. But it's not very common, right? So the, uh, trying to understand the history of pre-modern India is very, very complicated. And complicated in the sense that you know, it's a kind of thing which cannot be done without collaboration. I want to organize a conference at some point you know, to understand the nature of social power and their relationship with state power in the immediate pre-colonial period, right? something like what Sheldon Pollock does about the knowledge system, but on the question of political and social power. I want to do a discussion. I have to do a discussion where I need to get two groups of people. You know, some must be Sanskritists, and they must look at the text, which is called Veera Mitrodaya. <coughs> it's a, Sheldon Pollock says that it's one of the largest Sanskrit texts ever written on the question of Dharma. 
It's a Dharma Shastra text. Very late. It's written during the time of uh, Jahangir. In the court of uh, uh, of a king called uh, Veer Singh. So his name is there in the title, Veera, and the name of the author is Mitra Mishra. So it puts the title of the patron and the author in the uh, in the name of the book. You know, so it's called Veera Mitra there. It's in 12 volumes. And there's a very long volume, which is on Radha Dharma. Right. Now, this is written during Jangit's time. And the other text that I want to bring into the discussion is a text, very famous text called Siarul Mutakharin, which is written by a man called Gulam Hussein Taba Tabai. Partho has uh, made a few remarks about this uh, in some of his writings. I've also uh, made a few remarks. It's a book written by a Mughal intellectual at the time of Warren Hastings. It's a chronicle of Indian history from the death of Warren Hastings in 1707 to the time of Warren Hastings. It's presented to Warren Hastings, right? Uh, but it is a book which is written by somebody who has no modern education. He's a Mughal intellectual, right? And so I think the, prop, the complexity of the task arises from this. If we want to understand the relation between social power and political power, you have to put together a picture which is taken from the Hindu side through the Dharma Shastra. It doesn't talk about any dates, anything. It's written in a completely abstract, highly stylized style, like the Manusriti or the Shukraniti or things like that, right? And you have to match it on the other side with a chronicle, which is the real historical chronicle. In fact, he gives dates. In fact, this year this happened, and six months later something else happened, etc., etc. Right? But it's not abstract. It's not giving a picture of the society in an abstract form. So, how do we get a picture of social and political power in, uh, you know, pre-colonial India? You have to bring together you know, these two sources of knowledge, but in totally different languages. You know, uh, so somebody has to know Sanskrit, somebody has to know Persian. Sometimes people who know Sanskrit and Persian, they do not know political theory. So you have to have people who understand political theory and can ask the right kind of question. And it's only through a complex intellectual exchange of this kind that we can gradually start piecing together you know, a theoretical view of our society in the pre-modern period. So that is that is something that we need to do. And that's why I think it's so important to institute good Sanskrit and Persian language learning in our universities. You know, otherwise we would never be able to do this. In fact, our children will have to come to Colombia and to uh, and to Berkeley and learn Sanskrit here and then go into our text, which I think is absurd. Uh, so, uh, we have the last, last, last question by Amarji. So, I would request you to be please brief in your comments, sir. Sure. And, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, we had actually a lot of other questions, but if you want, but, we yeah. can mail, mail so, it to you. I mean, if, if, okay. if only it's suitable yeah. to you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Sir, it's a question about uh, my reading of your uh, five articles which you sent and my reading of al also with, on which I am working for my MFA. So I found, while reading, I found a great deal of emphasis was put on doing a historicist reading of Marx, which has been neglected, particularly and pro more prominently, you say, Bengali Marxist and their reading of historical materialism and Marxist critical interpretation. They are neglecting the philosophical task of inquiry into the nature of historicity, historicity itself in Marx's truth. So I was just wondering uh, if you can elaborate something on why this historicist element has to be emphasized. If a, I think partly you have answered this. If a good deal of literature in Marxism uh, says that it's coming particularly from my reading of a 
says that it is the science of social formation or historical materialism. I am not really sure that what the terms can be used interchangeably for the timing I am using. And here comes the question. And in such a case, what makes Marxism distinctive of Hegelianism? In other words, the question then becomes what is it about Marx method or what is the object of Marxist theory? Or what is it that Marxist theory studies? And through this uh, 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 kind of historicist reading, are we not disputing Althusser's notion of epistemological break and his uh, essay that Marxism is not a historicism? Yeah, it's, again, I think it's a very good question. I'll answer it briefly because we don't have much time. <coughs> you know, I much of my thinking is still very heavily influenced by Althusser. But I think Althusser was mistaken in his, uh, you know, he has a kind of comprehensive hostility towards Hegel, which I have gradually uh, overcome. Because, uh, I, you know, Althusser might have, might not have felt it because, you know, remember Althusser is not a Bengali, he's a Frenchman, so he is an inheritor of the French tradition. So there's a lot of Hegel, you know, which is simply assumed to be understood by people if you are studying philosophy in France during Althusser's time, when he was a student and when he was a writer in the 60s. So he doesn't have to spell it out. And so probably, you know, he himself or his, all, or his followers <coughs> might not have objected to some of these things that I'm going to say now. But I think in our case, the problem is, I've actually written five essays, some of them quite long, in Bengali, uh, on Indian Marxism. And the last essay, which is called Marx Bhadi Rupakhita Path, that is the neglected path in Marxism, has a long section on <coughs> both Hegel and Althusser, in which I have tried to show what Bengali Marxists would have got if they read Hegel more respectfully, and also if they read Althusser more respectfully. So let me make this point very quickly. The first point, um, how is Marx different from Hegel? Very, very simple, but I think absolutely profound. I do not know if I sent you the paper, which is a more popular paper, because I wrote it for undergraduate students in Presidency College. Um, Marx's Truth. I know uh, it's it. Yeah. So if you look at the section where I explain why, to me, Marx is a historicist, uh, because I think, you know, Marx is a historicist because Marx would never admit of a question about any society without asking when is it, where is it, right? What kind of society is it? Which is the historicist move? <clears throat> but I think the huge difference between Hegel and Marx is that Hegel believed that a society is unified by a certain kind of common ideological consciousness, you know, which he would call it Geist, right? So in the Greek world is united by its concept of beauty, the Roman world by its concept of order, and the modern world by its concept of freedom. It's a very Durkheim-like argument, right? It's a very, very Durkheim-like argument. But Marx said something totally shattering and startling about this. And here I have again become a bit critical about this, and I'm writing a paper which will, in which I'll set this out. I think in some ways also is quite right in making a distinction between his early writings and uh, later writing and the production related concept. But I think the economic philosophical manuscript makes a very important rupture with Hegel on this point. Because what is the major point in the section on alienation, you know, estrangement of labor? What it says is that there is no common experience of the society if the society is deeply unequal. So the Hegelian point that a society is held together, right, non-contradictorily, by a conception of beauty or order or freedom, right, that's the Hegelian position. Marx's position is startlingly different, you know, totally different. 
Marx said that there's nothing like that which holds society together, at least on social questions. People experience society completely differently. In fact, the example that I give to students, I'll give you that uh, example and finish. One day I was walking <coughs> down to my office in winter and a young black man came and met uh, from the other side and he said, do you have some change? I want uh, to have breakfast. So I, uh, you know, I was rummaging through my pocket and uh, so it was very embarrassed pause between him and me. And I found something and then gave him and he said, <coughs> uh, God bless you. And I'll have breakfast here. He pointed to a coffee shop across the Broadway and he went there. And during the pause, he said something which was totally shattering to me and also revealing. He said, while I was looking for <coughs> for money, uh, he said, sir, have you ever been homeless? So I said, no. But you know, I was totally shaken by that uh, in a particular sense because, you know, I recognized how uh, I didn't have an, I don't even now have an American passport. I have a green card. At that time, I didn't even have a green card. You know, I had a visa on which I was teaching in Colombia. But I said to myself that, look at this, that, you know, I'm not even a green card holder in this society, but I live the life of an upper middle class person in this society. And I walk in this road as if I own this road, right? And this is a person who has been in this country probably for seven, eight generations, right? And she has to shrink and, um, you know, try to sort of uh, gather himself, you know, gather, sort of shrink himself in a certain sense and abase himself to the extent of coming to me and asking for money from me to go and have his breakfast, right? So if somebody, what I tell the students is that if somebody asks me, uh, what is it like to live in New York? What is it like to live in the Upper West Side? Right? Strictly speaking, this is Marx's point. Strictly speaking, you cannot answer that question. He lives in Upper West Side. I live in Upper West Side. Right? But there's no normal equivalent. There's no commensurability between the way he experiences the world, not see the world or think about the world, the way he experiences the world, right? And the way I experience the world. So the answer to a question, which seems commonsensical, and it's a very logically similar question, which rings through our social science discourse. Now, what is American society like? What, what does it feel like to live in Upper West Side? What does it feel like to live in America? You know, think of the ease with which we ask a question of this kind. Right. And Hegel would say, you can't give an answer. Right. Marx is saying that you cannot give an answer. Right. They're both using historicism. Hegel's historicism is an unstructured historicism. Right. It's, Hegel is not a fool. You know, Hegel also understands that from time to time. If you read the section on the rabble in the philosophy of history, you'll see that Hegel has a very powerful section. And the section, if I uh, put it in a metaphor, it is actually like saying that the great vulnerability of the modern society is this, that <clears throat> it is like that in the middle of the road, you have a table in which 50 people are having a wonderful dinner, right? But it is surrounded on all sides by a glass wall, right? And there are 500 people who are completely hungry. They're looking through that wall into these people who are gorging themselves, right? So that is the rabble. So Hegel understands that there's a danger to the new modern society coming from this inequality, but he does not pursue that. You know, he doesn't, he notes that as an observation, leaves it there. Marx actually picks it up, not from Hegel necessarily, but Marx picks it up and turns that into the principle of the optics of social reality, right? 
you cannot look at social reality discounting this fact you know which is the most important fact that we live in a social social world is contradictory hegel's social world is not sufficiently contradictory marx's world is because marx says durkheim is right and hegel is right there is a sense in which society is one it holds us together in one society we cannot escape right and there are certain processes which are processes which actually make the society cohere hold it together etc right but there is no equivalence of experience by living in the same society if the society is marked by inequality of this kind right which i think is an enormous new truth you know and the truth is so powerful that a feminist uses it ambedkar uses it you know people who think about caste use it people who think about race use it people who think about you know sexual orientation etc they use it i think marx was marx was wrong about himself in a certain sense because he thought that he discovered something which he would use only in terms of class but i don't think it's an insight which is limited to class you know it's limited to incommensurability of experience coming through this kind of social hierarchy of any kind and the most important feature of the influence of marx to my mind is that we have forgotten where it comes from right a lot of people who think about caste etc and say well, what do you know about what i feel as a dalit right very often they would they wouldn't recognize that you know they would not think that they are using anything from marx but i don't think they could have said that you know the construction of that sentence itself would have been impossible in terms of the logic of intellectual history had there not been you know those two three pages in the economic philosophical manuscript about the estrangement of labor it's not about the estrangement of labor i think marx is wrong it's not about the estrangement of labor he got into something which is much deeper and much more universal and so that's why i would say that in marx is a historicist but by folding structure into historicism itself which i think nobody had done before him like that but again you know we should not exaggerate because hegel the picture of the rabble that you get in hegel in just two and a half pages very powerful picture right but he does not run with it this is the meaning of making theory it's one thing to have a big observation you know deeply insightful observation theory is different theory actually makes this observation so central to your optic so central to the logic of your thinking that it becomes unforgettable and it then you bring out all the implications of viewing it and not viewing it yeah thank you thank you professor kaviraj for no <laughs> for <laughs> and staying for this is long i mean and constantly i mean responding to you know each of the queries from us i mean uh, you know thank you so much i mean <laughs> yeah and we look forward to the questions for very good i mean i'm actually very very pleased that you uh, read the papers carefully and every single question i must say you know are were very good but also remember one thing i would partly modify what i said you know i said before and i i believe that very deeply that the very large part of the success in thinking is to formulate a good question right and many of you ask questions which i think are very interesting serious questions look at the question that the last question that was asked about hegel and marx but the thing is that you know simply asking the question is not giving an answer to it you know you have to think about Uh, the question itself and i hope that you know people like you who are interested in marx and uh, who are thinking about some of these issues you know you would be able to do things which people in our generation could not do because of our limitation you no know, lack of knowledge of language uh, you know lack of exposure to indian thought and things like that and remember that you should not you should not actually leave it to institutions to do it if you believe that you know you should uh, you need sanskrit to do something then don't complain that you know there's no sanskrit 
uh, you know, I my uh, college did not teach me that way. Go and learn. Okay. okay, sir. With, right. Yeah, with yeah, those remarks, we bring this to a closure. Thank, Thank you, Professor Tukaviraj, for then Professor uh, uh, Arun Patnaik and the first generation of uh, you know J CPS JNU scholars oh. who were there. Yeah, and then and uh, more importantly, I would like to thank Shivani, who has been you know just brilliant on the technical. Technical side. Technical she, she has been, you know, yeah, 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 on the background of doing everything from Google Meet to Facebook and everything. So, Same you know, again. special thanks to Shivani. And then, uh, you know, thanks to other discussants who, you know, asked those lively questions that made this session really enriching. And uh, thank Professor Kaviraj again for giving us this opportunity. And we think in future also, uh, if, you know, our schedule matches and there is a uh, you know some time in the schedule we can have you know continue with this kind of conversation thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you 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 th